Well, hello. Um, I've been up here speaking many times, but I think it's been a little while, so um, I see a lot of new faces out there. So it's October, and it's uh, the, the month, you know, for scary stories and such. Uh, I've got like 25 or 28 separate stories that I'm doing this month. I mean, I, usually I don't need notes, but I've gotten to the point for this month where I'm like been jumping all around giving talks everywhere and everybody wants something that's more localized to their area and it's just, it's just been um, a, a crazy month. So um, I, I try to do something fresh all the, all the time because I'm used to doing that now it seems. Um, let's see. What I'm going to do tonight is uh, I'll give you a little information about me and uh, how and the, the typical questions why and how I, I do this. Um, and I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, the, the, the biggest questions I get all the time isn't so much the stories themselves, but the whole, you know, how do I come by the stories and my methods and my research and all that. So I've kind of incorporated with doing that with uh, a chunk of the program so you can see where I'm um, fi finding the information. Um, and then I'm going to tell you two stories. One's a little bit lengthy, but and the other one is uh, kind of a short one and um, one of my particular favorites anyways. So, all right, well, for those who don't know, who, who am I? Um, um, as uh, Kim said, my name is Todd Warger, and I've worked at the uh, museum here as of this last April. I've been here for 25 years. And so I've done a mixed bag of all kinds of different types of research and exhibits, and I've curated shows. And so in the process, I've gone through newspapers and all kinds of sources for different things. And I always find these interesting stories and, and some bizarre happenings that have occurred in Whatcom County and Bellingham. And, uh, and so, you know, I got to stay focused, so I kind of pigeonhole this stuff thinking, well, someday I'll come back and look at it and see exactly what I've got. And um, I think I was just doing some cleaning out, and I realized my, my murder folder was morphing into folders. And there's some crazy stuff that went on uh, in, in, in the region here. So another thing that I kind of refer to uh, what I'm doing is sort of, I call it kind of fringe history. I have a lot of people that say, oh, I love reading the stories and I love hearing about these stories, but you know, I, I would never write this sort of thing and that sort of thing. And it's kind of on the cursory, you know, of you know, just regular history, but it is local history. And, you know, it, it is part of, you know, uh, who we are in our makeup today. And what I try to do with uh, my stories is um, I'm more interested in uh, the geographical area. So some people might say, yeah, but all your good stories are probably in book one. No, 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 no. I got some juicy stuff down the road if I ever do any more. Uh, but I'm more interested in, like, I want somebody in Maple Falls to want to read the stories and Glacier and Blaine and Sumas and not just have it, you know, a Bellingham thing. You know, I, I like spreading, spreading the... I guess uh, spreading the, the murder wealth all, all across the spectrum. And so and the other thing is my time period is typically from time of settlement uh, through the Great Depression. Uh, I feel that that's kind of a safe area uh, for me. And if you ask me the, the dynamics and how things are reported at the turn of the century are just more salacious than anything you would see on the news today, as you'll see from some of the research uh, um, images I'll show you. Um, and then the other thing I do is I, to the best of my ability, within the stories is not just jumping into a murder story, but uh, jumping into a, a period of time in which the homicide took place in, and maybe what was going on. I mean, what's going on in the community? What's going on in the state? What's going on nationally or worldwide? What's happening during the time of this particular event? So that's the other thing that I, I try to look at. And so each book will be about 13 stories. I think they're short stories anyways. 
And um, quite interesting, um, I have to say that uh, probably after book two and going into three, kind of wondered, you know, you know why, why am I doing this, for one thing. Um, I, I don't just do murder stories. Uh, if you ever saw the film The Mountain Runners, I, I, I put that together. Uh, another film I did was Shipyard, about the Bellingham Shipyards. I did a children's book on Big Ole, the whistle that used to be in town. I did another book of uh, Mount Baker, um, um, uh, Images of America. And actually, you know, n not, to, not to be a plug-in, but uh, uh, I did have a graphic novel come out two weeks ago, um, and it's uh, 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 my first one, and doing it with uh, a friend of mine. Uh, it's titled Invisible Empire, Madge Orberson and the Unmasking of the Ku Klux Klan, and it's a true story that took place in Indiana, and I'm not gonna go further into that because that's not why we're here. So I do uh, other things. Um, but I had to ask myself, you know, why, you know, uh, I love playing the detective in, in doing these stories. It's a lot of fun. And it's probably, I'm not going to say it's like gratifying, but what I can say is like playing the detective in some of these old cases, especially if they're cold cases and you're trying to figure out what uh, went on, it's, it's just kind of fun. You can play futuristic detective of something that happened in the past. But two things did come out of it that kind of really uh, gave me a lot of encouragement. Uh, one of them was is I realized after about 45 stories and so many more I was reading about that when you're looking at this area, um, the turn of the century, 1880s, 1890s, turn of the century, uh, this is a new part of the country for many people. Uh, I mean, certainly you could go up to Alaska, but this is like the last of the continental frontier. Uh, the forest was coming up to the, to the sea here or, or to the bay, and um, people were coming here to, to break the land, to, to, to homestead. Um, they came here to start out a new beginning. Uh, if you were in the professional league, let's say you're an attorney or a school teacher or a banker or a doctor, uh, places like New York, Boston, Detroit, Chicago, they were competing with many, many other professions. But they could come here and be a few, make a name for themselves and establish themselves where they wouldn't be able to do that maybe in New York. And so they came here for a reason, uh, they were compelled. And many of these people were, I mean, th these were hard, hard working people. Anybody could get out there and cut down the trees for their plot and just burn and dig out the, 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 the trunk, the trunks of the trees and stuff. I mean, like, these are hardy people. And unfortunately, unbeknownst to them, something occurred. Uh, their demise was to be here. And not to you know, say that every villain had a knife in their teeth and hiding behind trees. Um, yes, I mean, of course, like anywhere around, there was some really vile characters that were here. But there were some people, when you read about them, you just have to shake your head and go, circumstances were against them. And they were what they were. Um, I have the opportunity of reading Dying Testimony, uh, court case testimonies, um, uh, affidavits from people, and, and all this stuff. And I come to realize soon, a lot of these people, they would have had a, a, a life. Some of these people, maybe a few of them, might have become an author, maybe mayor. Maybe a few of them might have gone on to something else and really hire and make a name for themselves. Most of them, I think that they were just struggling for everyday existence. So I'm, when I'm reading testimony and I'm reading like a dying uh, a testimony of what happened to him 130 years ago, I realize that for this short period of time, while my books exist, I'm bringing them back to life. I'm giving them a chance to speak for themselves what happened to them. And I found that important. The other thing that I didn't expect, especially because I chose these types of stories, these old stories, is I didn't expect phone calls, emails going, 
you wrote about my, my uncle that was killed a uh, hundred years ago. Do you, do you know anything more that you haven't written about? Um, I had, uh, in 1906, uh, there was one of the most heinous murders uh, in the area up in Blaine, um, Addie Roper, and one year, um, well, two years ago, I had uh, her descendant come up from Olympia to spend the afternoon to talk to me. Weirdly enough, we, by before the year's out, I get the granddaughter from Portland who gets a hold of me, and her, grandfa great -grand her grandfather was the murderer in the same case. And, and we had discussions. Uh, two weeks ago, a woman got a hold of me that I actually know in, in concrete, says, my cousin killed somebody in 1960. I know her name, but nothing else. And within a week, I gave her a whole bunch of, of material. Uh, people have come to me and said, you know, I, I shouldn't be writing a story, but would you look into and maybe uh, consider writing about this family member? The point, oh, and, and the great one was New Year's, where I get an email one morning from London saying, you have a story in your book from 1884 from my great-great-great-grandfather that was killed in Nooksack. How the heck did they find out in London about the book? I have no idea. Why was he in Nooksack when he was born in London? Well, what I come to realize by hearing these stories is there was a, a, a these homicides, these murders, these, these slings that took place way back when created a rift. It divided families. These are like Oddly enough, for me, because I didn't expect this, is these are like unhealed scars within the family that they're trying to figure out what happened. They're trying to find the other half of a family. And so it's kind of uh, surprising. And so that was the other uh, reason why, if I have the opportunity to continue, I, I probably will. Um, so I, I'm going to go on and tell you the methods, but before I do that, I really got to set you up and say, what is it that I'm looking for? I mean, what are the murders that we're talking about? Some of these are so simple that you know them, it's common sense. But I'm going to go over them anyways, because then I want you to see the hard parts. So the types of murders I'm dealing with, well, we all know most of them, first degree murder. I mean, it's premeditated. Uh, we've had many of those heinous uh, uh, acts that uh, created uh, a, a lot of uh, hysteria in, in, in the town here going way back. Um, second degree um, murder, um, you know, not exactly premeditated and, um, or th thought out in advance, but but a, a murder that takes place, and I, I could go on and on giving examples, but I don't think I need to. Um, the ones that come up depending upon which state maybe you live in is like voluntary manslaughter or involuntary, and in some cases they combine the two. Uh, voluntary manslaughter I think is rather interesting simply because in older times, and in some places they still use the same phrase, but turn of the century they would refer to that as a crime of passion where something spontaneously happened. I can give you an example. Let's say uh, Madge went out with the girls one night and they went to the movie and they said, oh, you know, my husband had to work tonight, you know, but uh, I, I, can, I can stay out late. Hey, let's go to a bar, have a couple of margaritas. And they go in and there's Madge's husband and there's a girl sitting on her lap. She goes crazy, grabs a glass, breaks it and slices her throat. And we have a spontaneous uh, uh, crime of passion. And, uh, and unbelievably, 1880s, 1890s, if you read some of my books and stuff, you'll find out a lot of people got off <laughs> from, uh, 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 from, from going to prison because they were, they were emotionally heightened because of this, uh, of what happened to them. Um, so um, anyhow, all of these are, for me, fairly easy to, to research, but what about the ones that are not? What are the other ones that, that I'm working with? And these would be, um, which were more harder for me, is like a, a murder-suicide. It's like spontaneous in a lot of cases. Boom. Uh, something happens, we don't know what, 
and two or three kids are, are killed and the wife and then uh, the father hangs himself, what happened? And sometimes, I, you know, some of those I've been able to go through and try to pick up the pieces and try to figure out, even for myself, what might have happened. And if it's a hypothetical thing that I think, I will certainly state it. But sometimes today you can find some things that they weren't looking at back then. And in some of the cases I looked at, you know, I can say, yeah, you know, there's a possibility to hear of something occurring. Um, and if, 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 if later on somebody wants to say, hey, give me an example, I will, but I don't want to hang us up on this too, too much right now. Um, another one is cold cases. There's a lot of cold cases, and you know, you've got to put those things together. And um, those two, what makes it difficult? Well, obviously, there was no trial. There's no prisoner. And so there's a lot of records that you can't get into. And the other one is, uh, is almost like a crime of passion, which would be cases where the defendant got off. And I'll explain why that's a little bit more difficult here in the moment. So my methods, and so I'm gonna... So here's the three uh, volumes that I've done so far. Murder in the Fourth Corner is Whatcom County. More murder is Whatcom and Skagit. And then we get into some more Skagit. And there's even one from, uh, uh, from San Juan County in it. So when I started looking around, I also looked around for some secondary resources, and at the same time, I wanted to see what was sort of done similar on the same subject. Uh, these three books on the top, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're decent reads. They're not bad. Um, I was kind of disappointed with uh, Rock, uh, Rock Gut and Outlaws when I was reading about Jake Terry and Sumas, and I soon realized that the writer virtually just took the newspaper word for word and just, and just went with that. I mean, um, I guess that's just an easier way of uh, putting a story out and nobody would know the difference. Um, Manhunts, um, Hollis here is absolutely fantastic. It was done in the, I think, late 50s. Um, I found this one online. I've yet to find another copy, but he was, uh, Hollis was a, uh, um, um, uh, an investigator for the secretary of, uh, uh, for the state attorney, and then he wrote about some, some stories that happened in, in Washington State, and it's, it's a good, it's a real good read. I don't even know where he got some of his material. So, one of the first things I do, some of you are probably familiar with uh, the uh, Digital Archives uh, Washington uh, government site. So I, I, I refer to it as the Washington State Digital Archives, but it's uh, uh, digitalarchives.wa.gov. And it's put out by the, you know, the state archives. It's their... their uh, uh, website. They're adding to this thing all the time, and you can see a list there of, of, of a lot of things that you can look up. I mean, marriage records and divorce records, cemeteries, and I mean, the list goes on. I think there's even more than this. There's photographs um, for certain areas. Of course, my area that I'm interested in is institution records and frontier justice. And so, uh, if I go to uh, institution records, uh, it has the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla from the time it opens to 1945. So what I do is I just simply got in there and I just went to the last, you know, putting in the last, I opened up the uh, institution that I go to the last name and I just go literally A. B. C. D. It sounds tedious and long, but it brings me up you know, all the prisoners for that time, alphabetically, then I go to Whatcom County, and then I look for all the, the murder ones. And so, I mean, that was the easiest way I found. And in those, uh, typically here you would find um, um, their, their name, uh, their inmate number, uh, the crime that they, they had, uh, 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 that they had done, um, where they were convicted from, Whatcom County, what year they were received at the penitentiary, and um, it usually tells what nationality they are or, or what state or where they're from, age, and sometimes they've been adding more now, I noticed, in the past two years, mugshots. And so I collect that material. Uh, the other thing I could do, too, is uh, 
you know, I, I think it's kind of unutilized sometimes as the northwest branch of the, uh, uh, the state archives up here. And they do have a criminal file index. I found it kind of hard to use sometime because I found that the, uh, the, the index numbers don't correlate a lot of times with the actual record. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But anyhow, this has been a kind of a foolproof for me. And let's see. And, and then also I want to say that the regional archives here, not just Whatcom County, it's the region up here. And so they have Skagit, Snohomish, San Juan uh, County, uh, Island, Jefferson. I think that's all of them, Whatcom. I might be missing one or two, I'm not sure. But anyhow, you go up there and I can either get the, the, um, the, their um, criminal file number and either go to the county or, for the most part, a lot of those uh, records are still in paper up here and I've been able to pull and peruse a lot of those. So, it, I mean, it's a fantastic resource for the type of work that I'm doing. And then, uh, my favorite part is now that I have this information, then I grab my little bag and I go over to the clerk of court over at the uh, superior uh, courthouse, go up on, I think it's third floor, and go in and go up to the counter and I'm like, I'm here to look at microfilm of all these, these murder cases. And, you know, you can do that. You can go in, and that's part of the, the, the um, um, things that they uh, let you do over there. Uh, the first couple of times, they got scratched, you know, heads like, really? And then I'm like, well, doesn't anybody look at these things? And they're like, well, now and again, somebody will come in and look up a divorce, but not very often. So, which tells me this is a very unutilized uh, resource. And so, you know, I'll go over for a day or two, and they're... Well, I haven't been over lately, but they're kind of used to me. And so, and then I'll go through and, and look up the uh, court records. Um, let's see here, what have I got? And so, within those records, I might find such things as, um, uh, in this case here, uh, this is a, a filing for information. So, this is the filing for, um, well, who we got here? David Long, uh, I think this is 1880, uh, 1892? I think that's what it was. But anyhow, this is the filing that he's been charged with murder, and sometimes it's hard to read, but it'll tell me, you know, who he murdered, when he murdered. Um, it'll tell me uh, it's some other, you know, information, maybe some more detail. And sometimes, not often, but sometimes it might say where it occurred. But anyhow, that's my, the, the first record that I'm typically going to find. And then uh, from there, I could be finding, let's see, um, within the, the microfilm, or if, I, if they do have it up at Western, uh, you know, at the regional archives, I'd be looking at, um, you know, the information, all kinds of other court papers, a lot of um, refilings with amendments, of course. Um, calls for jurors and uh, lists, subpoenas, uh, transcripts of the trial if I'm lucky, hopefully some good lengthy transcripts, which you don't always find. Sometimes you just find pieces, sometimes none. Um, I'll also find, uh, uh, like I said, tons of just legal documents, uh, uh, affidavits probably from uh, different people, uh, judges' uh, directions for the jury, uh, the verdict, and um, uh, testimony. Uh, and then the inevitable, what I always find regardless, even if there's nothing in the folder, uh, the bean counter always wants to know how much money they have spent on the jury, uh, their, their mileage, uh, their, their food, what they ate, where they ate, and um, you know any other court costs. That seems to be like the most important thing if there's nothing else in the file. And believe me, I have found countless files where, whether it was paper or microfilm where I go, okay, I can't wait to get into this. That's all I got is receipts for juror meals. And I've, I've had that many a times, so um, uh, who, who knows? Um, here's a kind of a more modern up-to-date one that I can actually read, uh, which um, is great when you get into the, the latter years. Um, beautiful handwriting, so this is sort of um, uh, t talking about uh, uh, one of the murders that had occurred. Transcripts. Um, I think, um, 
you know, now, well, I'll wait on this. But anyways, the transcripts are, are, are always interesting. Sometimes I'll be like, I could have an inch too thick, in, in, two inches maybe thick, sometimes just a couple of pages. It's, like I said, it's like Christmas. Every time I open to something, I have no idea what's going to be in it because half the time it's, where did the material go? Newspapers. I love going through the old newspapers. This is where I find a lot of this stuff. Uh, here we go with uh, Jake Terry, Sumas 1907, a very serious desperado. And I mean literally one of the, probably the last of the Old West um, uh, guys, uh, gunman and smuggler and, and everything else. And um, he, he was the terror of the West Coast. He was uh, involved in the first and probably only uh, a, a Canadian train robbery and a whole bunch of other train robberies. Anyhow, newspapers, I'll look at those at any given time. A lot of times I'll, I'll in concurrent with everything else, or if I, I hate to say it, but if I'm bored, I might go and just sit for a couple hours looking through old newspapers and see what pops up. But um, what's cool about them is, if you're lucky, the older papers, images. It's not like anybody ran around with a camera taking pictures of murders and people. I mean, it, it just didn't happen. So whatever I find, I, I feel very fortunate that, that I, I'm able to find them. Um, so the newspapers are great for that resource. Also getting kind of an overall sense of what went on. Um, and um, another thing that I find interesting to them is a lot of the older paper, they'll have a court um, a court uh, 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 reporter who's in there, and he's doing the testimony. And I've compared the two from the actual record to here, and I'm like, wow, they're, they're really on the money. I mean, they're, they're almost, almost verbatim. The cool part is when I'm looking at the transcript, I could get something like, well, let's see, uh, uh, prosecutor Perringer, who, who was one of the, the prosecutors way back when, you know, the transcript could say, um, uh, uh, question. Uh, so tell me, Bob, you did murder your wife, didn't you? Bob, uh, or I should say answer, no, sir, I did not. I swear I did not. Where the newspaper will be, you know, uh, Perringer leaps from his, his chair and pounds the table and says, you know, Bob, whatever, you, you murdered your wife, didn't you? The hush came across the, the, the crowd in, the, in a crowded, packed, you know, uh, courtroom. No, sir, I did not. Tears streaked from his face. And, and it's like, so I can kind of weigh that out from the, the stiff, you know, court reporting to, to what's being put out there in the public. And I've always found that quite entertaining. The other things that I'm, I'll click through here so you can look at some of these great headlines. Um, the other thing that I'm actually looking at is, this is a source where I'm going, well, what else is going on in town? Never mind the murder. That day or the trial day, which is could be six months later, but what else is going on? You know, what other news is happening? And I'll kind of filter that into the story. Or, you know, things that you wouldn't think about, I'll look and see what, what was the weather report that day. And so different things like that always kind of makes the story come alive a little, just a little bit more. Now, this is, a, this is one that I haven't done yet, but one that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slowly working on. Yeah, yeah, Joe uh, in 1929 kind of went uh, all Lizzie Borden on four people. Uh, not, a, not, a, not a great story. I mean, a, a, a good writing story, but not a good situation. Uh, this one here, I'm going to be talking about in concrete on the 24th. Uh, we'll be coming back to Romendorf here uh, shortly. I'm going to use him as an example. Uh, 1910, he was captured on the other side of the state, but for the first half of the, uh, of the turn of the century, he was in Maple Falls, and as far as we know, there's at least three to four bodies unaccounted for on his property somewhere. There could be very much more out there. He's probably one of the first serial killers that's documented coming into the state. He killed so many people that he lost count. He claims in trial that he thinks maybe around 100. Not here, but from um, Germany to South Africa, through the United States, all the way to here. But we're gonna, I'll use him as an example for something shortly. Martin Levine, um, I'm gonna, t 
Martin, Martin Levine, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here in a moment. Uh, 1937, on the uh, streets of, uh, of uh, uh, Anacortes during the, um, the Mariner Parade, the first Mariner Parade that they had down there, uh, according to uh, Martin, his gun happened to discharge five times on the street, gunning down his wife, and it was just a plain accident. Anybody can see that. And if you're lucky, some of these larger trials that were really heinous that's going out on the AP wire, you might be lucky to get some, uh, uh, some uh, block prints that are in the paper. This one here was Blaine, Addie Roper, and it didn't exactly happen like this, but, um, but needless to say, a lot of artwork. This was uh, here in town, and he was actually a witness, but he was so drunk at the time. He was the town drunk, and by the time he sobered off, he doesn't remember anything he saw. But it was still a, a, a pretty uh, funny image. Uh, so what do I do next? I take all this material that I've got. I've gone through the newspapers. I've gone through the court records here. I looked and seen what, wherever I could pull up at Western. Next thing I do is I try to get a bunch of these cases together. I'll call down at, to Olympia, to the state archives, and I'll say, I'm coming down. These are the list, and they're, they're, they're semi-used to me now. And so I'll go down and they'll pull all these records. So what am I looking for down there? I'm looking for uh, the inmate records. And uh, those will tell me from the time of received, uh, mug shots, their entrance papers coming into the prison system. Um, they give me height, weight, tattoos, what the tattoos are, the color of the tattoos. One person that I found said, prisoner suffers from ingrown toenails. Um, it'll give me like anything and everything going in and uh, a statement from them usually and then the prosecutor's statement of why they're really there. Um, and um, uh, uh, that's some stuff. So, oh, well, well, before we get there, I'm just going to pause for a minute. We're going to pause and say, well, what else am I looking for if I'm not doing a, a more modern, well, a, a, a time period from like Walla Walla? Uh, this is an example here of the territorial court records. And, you know, you get 40, 50 pages of this and trying to read it, it's, it, it's not that, that easy. Um, so so um, they're usually always handwritten. This is kind of interesting. I had to bring this up down at, in Olympia. And do, do you know, does anybody notice anything odd about this? This is a, um, um, uh, a, a summons for uh, uh, Charles Mitch, Charlie Mitchell. He's been... Uh, going to uh, uh, court for uh, murder in the first degree. Uh, the funny thing that I had to bring up, um, this is, what, see, 1883, this is right before Skagit County separated uh, from Whatcom County. A lot of people don't realize at one time Skagit was Whatcom. And so um, if a trial didn't occur here, there's a chance it would occur in La Conner. And if it didn't happen in La Conner, um, Port Townsend, which is, you're like, well, that's not Wacom either. So anyway, so why is that? So I asked, I've seen this a couple of times, and I'm like, well, why does the seal have this? And so I got a couple of chuckles down in, in, in Olympia, and they said, well, this is what we have heard. And this is, you know, it, it could be different somewhere else, but this is what we've heard. Uh, they said that, in this time, the judge who's going around is typically like going around on horseback from town to town and seeing who is there to be on trial. So people would be waiting until it was their, their turn to come up. Um, if there's only one prisoner up here, say, the judge would probably say, send him down to Lacan or I'm not gonna go all the way up there. And in some cases, if the, they might just pack them all up and send them to uh, Port Townsend where the judge would go to and just try everybody. And in a lot of cases, another thing that swings from this too is this is also during a time 
when everybody watched how much they're spending on trials because you're the taxpayer. There's a lot fewer people here. They're paying for a trial, and they don't want to spend a lot of money. So there was a lot of shuffling of sending prisoners around and trying to throw them into somebody else's lap. That was another issue that went on. And that's why a bunch of them at this time period and earlier ended up in Port, Town, uh, Port Townsend. So this is what I was told anyways. The, and the seal uh, for, there's no judge here who has the official seal. And so they would put this mark on it to make it official. If anybody knows anything different, that's what I was told and it makes about as good as much sense to me as anything else. Uh, here's just a, 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 an example of uh, a subpoena. Uh, for this is 1901 and so this is the material that I'm looking at too you know and so what am I looking for now when I go to Olympia inmate records a lot of times later on a lot of the photos are, are separated but in this particular case you know there's books of them and here's our buddy right here uh, Mr. Rormendorf here who uh, is becomes guilty in Stevens County and sentenced to death and is sit, sent to uh, uh, Walla Walla. And you can tell he's kind of a real friendly sort. Uh, this is an example of um, um, his entrance record. Obviously he wasn't there long, so his record wasn't that thick. I don't know if you can see much of it. But it gives you a kind of a sense of what I'm seeing. Uh, this is a letter from him um, uh, that um, uh, went to the uh, governor, I th if, if I remember correctly, of um, w w why he ended up in the situation that he got in. In this particular circumstances, I was very surprised to find evidence in the file. So these were, uh, 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 um, he had a, uh, um, uh, a method of, of killing people and getting their property. And I mean, it, it goes into depth, but these are kind of uh, fake uh, bank checks and he would have stamps and stamped everything himself. And let's see, what do we got here? This is, Oh, this is a return of execution that he was definitely executed. And um, a copy was probably sent up here as well because there was a telegram that was sent um, from the sheriff uh, wanting to know if there was any last confessions because they were tr still trying to settle um, those who were somewhere buried in Maple Falls right now. And before he uh, was sentenced for execution, he did several pages of a cryptic message that said, if anybody can figure this out, you will have all the answers of all the people I murdered and where the information is. Here's a letter from Secretary Secret Service Department trying to decode it. They never did. So anyhow, that's the type of material that I would find. Also, I would find correspondence, letters going to the warden, and, and the communication is both ways. There's always copies of what's going out. I would find um, um, uh, letters even after the prisoner probably died in, in prison, for like a decade later, there's family members going, you know, Harry Watts was in jail there, can you tell me, you know, anything about him, our family needs to know. And so there's um, um, uh, always something interesting. Uh, another example of uh, uh, a more modern, if I find the, uh, uh, the mug shot, uh, this one here is out of Cedro. She gives a statement on top what happened. The prosecutor gives a statement below. Um, so that gives you an example. These folders are sometimes very, very thick and sometimes very, very thin. You just never know what you're going to get. These come out of the typical mugshot uh, uh, box, which is a separate thing. Here's, a, here's an ugly cuss. The other things that I'm looking at also is um, uh, the governor's pardon papers. Oh, these are fun going through. Of course, everybody wants to be pardoned, so those files are usually very thick. There's, there's 
petitions, letters uh, from the, uh, t t to the governor to let so-and-so free. There's correspondence usually between the uh, Department of, of uh, 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 um, parole and appeals in the governor and it's amazing how much involvement goes on there's letters from the prisoner and it's just it's just amazing of how much time is taken doing uh, some of these as I will give you uh, uh, an example uh, Levine the guy whose gun went off uh, five times accidentally uh, he escaped two times from uh, prison and um, he, he, he was very upset because although he was given the right to work outside the prison, while well, they wouldn't parole him, and he's like, well, if, if I've earned the right to leave and work, I should have the right to leave. And that was his argument. And so he devises this crazy plan. I was shocked. I, I asked for his uh, par uh, parole and uh, uh, papers and the governor's papers, and I had, I had emailed down, and they got back to me, and I thought, you really want these? And they're like 500 pages, and that's the ones that were kept. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I had a little note that said, your man is a very colorful character. I would suggest all 500. So I went ahead and got him. So what he had done is, is he had a letter com uh, writing campaign go on. He becomes ordained, and he goes to every religious faction imaginable. He, it didn't make any difference. It was Catholics. I mean, it was, it was Catholics and Protestants and everybody. And said, go to your parishioners and have them flood the governor's office. And they did. Thousands of letters were coming in and driving them nuts. And this is one of the letters. And, oh, I just, you know, if you read, this is from uh, the head of the uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, prison uh, terms and paroles to the governor. I, it, it's just crazy. I have just answered a letter uh, directed to you from Reverend um, uh, Armin Holzer, uh, uh, the date. This man, Levine, is nothing but, well, it's supposed to be a but, but a pest, and is writing hundreds of letters appealing to people everywhere. He has a bad record, as a copy of my letter will show. Uh, it seems to me that the censors at Walla Walla should not allow inmates to send letters out to their friends asking them to appeal to your offices in our, in our office in their behalf. It takes up a lot of time, and as far as I can see, it is absolutely unnecessary. I am told that the mail coming out of Walla Walla is censored by the inmates, which is a very bad situation, one which I hope can be corrected. So there are some crazy letters when you read these sometimes, and they're, they're quite entertaining. <laughs> um, before I, I, I get to this, I just want to say there is also a packet of uh, parole and appeal uh, uh, letters and stuff that you can go through. So, there's, so overall, what am I getting down there? I'm getting correspondence from citizens, prisoners, families, attorneys. There's a lot of attorney uh, um, letters. There's, um, um, uh, there's dialogue going between the parole board, the governor, and the warden's uh, uh, office covering many subjects. Um, Letters uh, going years, like I said, after the inmate is, is dead. Medical information, conduct, uh, escapes, grievances that the prisoners might have, um, appeals for their release, and uh, parole and release documents. I mean, this is the, the crutch of, of, of the information that I'm looking for. And then, of course, other resources I'll go through. Um, the uh, regional archives up here has turn-of-the-century sheriffs and the... Uh, uh, the, the sheriff's uh, arrest records and the Bellingham uh, police records. Um, I didn't realize this. I found this uh, not too long ago. It was put onto it, but Skagit County did all these oral histories, and some of these people that they interviewed witness murders or were part of them. And so I, I got to uh, look at that. True Detective Magazine, you know, these were from like the 30s and 40s and 50s. It was like, what was the police gazette and digest and all that stuff. So how did this come about? I was digging around a few years back, and I became aware of this gentleman um, on the East Coast who bought up all these defunct 
magazines from uh, this time period. And I sent his name, it was Patterson. I don't even know if he has a first name. He only goes by Patterson. And I said, hey, do you have anything by any chance from Whatcom in Skagit County? And he sends me a list. And so when I looked at this, you might say, yeah, you know, really, what, you know, is, is this going to be like really a, a crazy account on things? And then I realized that a lot of the sheriffs and police, th th these guys are retired. They're writing about their, their biggest cases and getting them published. Uh, DeHaven was a, 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 a sheriff and he was with the police department here. And he's writing about a 1907 case up in Blaine. And it's not like people kept photos. His photos are not great, but they're images that I didn't have before. And photos. Um, photo images are a must, so I go through the archives here. Um, I go through, you know, uh, uh, private uh, collections all over. Skagit County has a lot of museums, and they have photos that depict up here as well as down there. And uh, so I always, oh yeah, and you got to have an invitation to a hanging. And so this is in book three. It's the uh, first public hanging in. Uh, Whatcom County and the last one in the state occurred here. A lot of people probably don't know that. Uh, some people ended up at the Looney Bill bend here down in Skagit. Got to have an autopsy. You know, it is murder we're talking about. Prison photos. So, you know, collecting as much as I can uh, during the historical period is always a, a fun in, uh, in telling a story and kind of bringing it to, to life. Um, down a Walla Walla. Another thing that I, I, I popped into recently, local history books. And, you know, there's a lot of local history books that people have read, and, and I've read them and, and cured some, some good material. And I happened to be talking to Jeff one day up in the archives here at the museum, and I was talking about the uh, Roy Franklin Jones book, uh, Border Town. And if you haven't read it, he was a, grew up as a, as a boy in, in Sumas and all these things that went on there in these histories, and each chapter is, is a story. One of them is Jake Terry. And I said to Jeff, I said, geez, I wonder where his material is. And Jeff says, oh, I, we have it here. And I says, well, I'd love to see if there's photos he didn't use, because when I was doing that story, you know, um, uh, Roy wasn't just using, you know, looking at a murder. He was doing all these chapters. So we pulled out the box, and yes, I found some photos. But I also found all the correspondence that he did with people who lived there at the time. And a lot of material he didn't use in his book um, about Jake Terry being up there. And the other thing that was even more valuable to me is after the book was published, people started writing to him about the book. In some cases, it was like, well, some of us old guys are still around and stuff, and I didn't want anybody to know what I knew about Jake Terry, and you know, and so I didn't want you publishing it, but I'll tell you the story now. And there's all these letters of all these other stories that didn't exist before. So it's always worth looking into work that's been gone through to see what wasn't wasn't previously used. And of course, I always go to the websites, Genealogy Bank, Heritage Quest, uh, um, Ancestry, and other various sites to look at stuff. I went into Heritage Quest once and looked up a murder from, I mean, a person from 1900, and somebody in the family put over 100 documents on of their trial. And I was shocked. I mean, like, it just saved me so much legwork. Another shot of uh, Walla Walla. Maps. Got to have maps. The Sanborn fire maps are fantastic. And um, in some of the stories, you know, that I hear, um, we had uh, uh, diagrams uh, done so that you would visually could see what was going on. This was a shootout on uh, a wharf in uh, Samish Island. Uh, the Great Northern Train uh, holdup that was botched. Three people were killed. Um, there was a trial. They never caught the people, but there was a trial and, uh, for a guy that they thought who did it. And so I went through all the testimony of what everybody had seen. And in doing so, everybody was saying where they were sitting in the car. And so I was able to do a map of where everybody was sitting. I thought that was, was kind of 
kind of that fun detective work. So uh, before I tell you a story or two here, I want you to look at this image. I looked at this image for a long time, and to me, it's a, a, it, 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 something popped out for me. Um, first of all, I, I'm just going to point out Andrew Williams here. Uh, he's a, 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 a cop. Uh, here in uh, for Bellingham, but later on he's going to become the sheriff. And I would, if I knew anybody would read it, I would try to do a one-off on him because this guy probably had the most incredible and, and tragic and hardest sheriff uh, uh, tenure that I can imagine. But anyhow, I'm looking at this photo, and this is what I'm thinking. Um, each town is going to have a justice of the peace, a marshal, uh, a constable, or a night patrol person, or you know, or a chief, or a captain. Um, Bellingham obviously is going to have a larger force. Uh, Mount Vernon had a actually at the same exact time they had a sheriff and, and a deputy. It wasn't a large force. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking what I said earlier. People are coming here, they're breaking the land, they're establishing them, themselves. So when you look at this, how many of these officers do you think went through the police academy? Um, how many of them do you think had decent training? Maybe a few of them might have come from a larger city, maybe from Seattle, and they knew what they were doing and they came up. Um, most of the smaller towns, you know, Blaine and Acme and, and um, you know, Maple Falls, you know, they probably have one marshal. And um, for the most part, you know, these people are, uh, the, the ones uh, um, here in town and probably out in the counties, they're, they're voted in, and then they probably hire, you know, their, their, their people under them. So how do they know what they're doing? Um, a lot of the cases I do, there's some really good, very clever, very smart detective work. Uh, I give Williams here great credit for that. And... Anyways, my point, especially when you're out in the county, um, Bill, who's out in Maple Falls, let's say, he's got a farm and he's making in so much money and all of a sudden um, a position opens up and he goes, well, gee, you know, that 40 bucks a month sounds pretty good to me. It doesn't mean he knows what he's doing, but people in town are going, oh, yeah, Bill's a great guy. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a good buddy. Yeah, I'll vote for him. Well, he, Bill's hoping that nothing happens on his shift. For the next year or two or whatever he's been voted in for, he's kind of hoping, oh, I'm going to break up some drunks who are probably friends of mine, you know, and maybe some kids will get in trouble or there'll be a break-in, but he's certainly not, he's hoping that he's not going to have maybe two people massacred on his watch. So, like I said, in many cases, I got a lot of cold cases. I got a lot of people, I wonder if they were really guilty, but there is some, still some good detective work that does occur. Now, I just want to bring you to two stories. I'll try to make them as short as I can. The first one is Mrs. Thomas's Potato Patch. Has anybody read this story by any chance? <laughs> got one. Uh, <laughs> so where is Ganelda Thomas? And that's on the lips of everybody in Fairhaven in 1908. The big question is, all through that, uh, um, uh, that summer of 1908, was she just dropped out and nobody has seen her. Um, she was last seen July 19th, and it's now heading into, it is into September. And she owned or had her and her husband, ex, ex husband, had a very rough shod house referred to as being on the far side of Happy Valley, totally against the forest wall. Uh, from this direction, I'm not sure which it is. Uh, Jeff told me once in archives, and I, I, I can't remember now. But anyways, the point is, is this is an image that he thought was as close to that period as we're going to get. And literally, out her back door is her garden and her fruit trees and the forest. And that's where uh, um, uh, her property is. And the last person who had seen her was, of course, her abusive ex-husband, James Thomas. Um, actually... Um, both had a great record of being mentally and physically abusive to one another. It was not one-sided. And uh, to the point where they were well-known in court and by the police who went out all the time on first-name basis, which is a lot to say in 1908 when everybody was Mr. and Mrs. Um, Thomas claimed that um, he just said, you know, 
we had dinner on the 19th, and Ganelda said, I'm going to go south, use the keys to the house, take care of the chickens and take care of the, the, the crops out back here, and, and uh, you know, you don't need to know where I'm going. You know, and, and believe me, he, James is not a rocket scientist by any means. And so um, he would tell everybody that she went south and he's been taking care of the house all summer. He figured that maybe uh, she probably went to visit a cousin in California, or more likely their daughter, Ethel, who was at the Chalet Estate Training School, which, by the way, he had her put in so he wouldn't have to pay child support. Uh, she was 14. Ethel grew up in a world of fighting parents and drunkenness, and no, there's no wonder why the girl was out, you know, running around town uh, late at night. And during the divorce, like I said, Thomas took great advantage of that, thinking, well, that'd be one last mouth I'll have to pay for my support on, and really uh, put a knife into Ganelda because uh, her daughter was her pride and joy. So. Uh, Bellingham uh, Police uh, Chief uh, Hiram Cade was getting calls. Ganelda's gone. We don't know where she is, man. But, you know, all we know is Thomas has been on a drinking binge all summer long. And it's not like he worked. Um, and so they asked him to check this out. So knowing what he knew, he, he sent a call down to Chileas to only find out that Ethel had not heard from mother since July. And uh, sure enough, in his inquiries, he found out for some reason Thomas is now flush with cash and he is so intoxicated every day that uh, uh, he's, he's, where is he getting the money from, basically? Uh, so who are these two people first? We've got to have a little background. So James Thomas, who's 36 years at the t time, was born in New York. He married Ganelda, um, his wife, who was from Norway, in uh, Tacoma in 1892. They moved to Fairhaven. Haven in 1898, probably because his father William lived there and his sisters, uh, both his sisters lived there. And um, his father William owned several lots of land, about a dozen lots in Fairhaven. And he himself lived at, lived at 2322 Happy Court, which is a bunch of apartments today. William gave uh, uh, the couple several, area, uh, several lots of land, all the way in the back, of course. And um, who built the house, nobody knows. But uh, they did have a, a, a three-room first floor and an attic. Uh, James, as I said, was uh, the family took pity on him simply because he was not very smart. He was very lazy, and he was a drunk. Um, what Ganelda was like before the marriage, I don't know. I can't believe that she was too surprised about what she was getting into. Then... Um, uh, when in need of money, if he didn't find a quick job, his sister Della Dyer uh, was the landlady at the Monogram Annex Hotel Apartments at the 404 uh, block of Harris Avenue. And I had a photo somewhere of, of the building, and I just couldn't find it to show you. Uh, of course, uh, the relationship was uh, bad. G uh, Ganelda, especially after her daughter was taken, was extremely depressed, and she drank all the more than she, what she was doing before. So uh, February of 1906, uh, she finally got some strength in her and decided to divorce her husband. And in uh, the uh, suit for divorce, she received three plots of land, the house, and $7.50 a month um, support, which her ex-husband at this point refused to pay. And so, but uh, he was still coming to the house three or four times a week having his way with his ex-wife, but staying there. So what the relationship was really like, we really don't know. Until September 25th is when everything happens, 1908. Um, I cheated and got these out of my own book instead of <laughs> looking for the photos. But here we have uh, uh, Hiram Cade here to the uh, left and uh, Virgil uh, uh, Perringer, who is the uh, prosecutor. And... Um, uh, Cade uh, decided that they need to investigate, so he sends uh, police captain Alexander Callahan, uh, who I think is a very handsome gentleman down here on the lower right, uh, along with uh, uh, Detective Thomas Nugent, 
uh, who you can see is on the top left, and Officer Crossland to go investigate. Uh, Virgil, uh, the prosecutor, knowing w what's been going on, goes with them. So the four of them jump on the trolley, they go down the uh, Happy Valley in Fairhaven, and they get off and they walk to the back, far side, uh, to uh, uh, the house, expecting the worst, of course. Looking around the grounds, they notice right off that the fruit's gone, the vegetables are gone, and the chickens are gone. There's just empty coops. And uh, Crossland at this point pulls out his big, massive skeleton keys and finds one that fits the house, goes in, and they discover the whole house is tossed. The drawers are open, clothes are everywhere, the trunk is on the floor, the whole place has just been ransacked. And as they're split up and looking around, soon Crossland yells out, come here, gentlemen, come here. And as they went downstairs and into the bedroom, they find blood all over the floor, blood all over the pillowcase, and blood soaked into the mattress. But no Mrs. Thomas. So not knowing what to do from this point, they decide to go down to Williams' house in Happy Court looking for James, who is where he's supposed to be living. And they're banging on the door and nothing. No, no William, no James. Callahan was about ready to leave and he looks up to the peak and he sees through the window Thomas peeking through the curtains and yells up, Thomas, get down here right now. Get down here or we'll smash the door in. And just from that alone, he books them on suspicion and they haul them in to this building downstairs in the basement in the padded cell area, which they considered to be the smallest one, and, and they wanted to shrink the walls around him. So they just let him stew. The next day, they go back out. They go through the house. They can't find uh, any other sign than what they found. So they go out in the backyard. They pull out some saplings and cut the limbs and go ahead and they sharpen the edge and they go around and start poking the ground. And soon, um, Nugent up there goes over to some, some potato uh, vines and sees they're dead and throws them to the side and starts probing the ground. And all of a sudden, and the probe goes right down, straight through the ground, and this stench comes up that bowls them over. And he says, according to the paper, which I love, boys, I, I think I found something. Yeah, pretty obvious. And so they go over and they feverishly dig with whatever implements they could find. And soon they find a log and they pull the log out and they dig some more and they see a blanket and they pull up the blanket and they see the lower half of the torso, which for them was the most gruesome sight they've ever witnessed. Uh, a deteriorated mass of soupy flesh and bone, the paper said, although a portion of the corpse was mysteriously mummified. So they say, stop here, boys. They get a hold of the, uh, oh, we may as well advance one. They get a hold of the uh, coroner who comes out and they dig up the rest of the body and what they discovered was is the upper portion is mummified because Thomas in somehow in form and fashion, somehow he must have got some intelligence that didn't exactly work and they discovered that uh, he had built a furnace and was attempting to cook her body to deteriorate it but the flu got stuck and so his efforts obviously did not work. Um, the body was in such bad shape that they, uh, he, they did a thorough look at the body there. They were afraid it was gonna fall apart by the time it got into town. Uh, the coroner figured that there was at least one bullet hole in the chest and he noticed that part of the cheekbone was gone. Um, so Callahan and Cade decide they were not gonna tell Thomas of the discovery, but they were gonna sweat him. So what they decide to do is to start pounding on him about what happened to his wife. And each time, um, uh, he's like, well, I don't know. You know. He gave me the key and she laughed. How do I know where she is? She's my ex-wife for crying out loud. How do I know where my ex-wife goes? And they ask, well, where'd you get all the money for the booze when you don't work? Why was the house ransacked? Why is all the, the garden, all, you know, all the food's all gone? Why are the chickens gone? And, Matter of fact, um, maybe you might know something about the blood all over the place. Well, he swears he didn't know a thing. So the sweating failed, so they decide now that they were going to uh, uh, put a reporter in there to kind of ask him a bunch of questions and see if he slips up. 
And the reporter, one of the questions that was in the paper was, well, if she went on a trip, how come she didn't bring her clothes and she didn't bring her shoes and she didn't bring her trunk? To which he said, I don't know. I think she was in a hurry. I said, we're not working with a rocket science here. Um, so Callahan tried one more trick. Right before leaving, oh, about an hour before leaving that night, he poked his head in the cell and uh, said to Thomas, you know, how are you doing? Have my boys been good to you? Have you had enough to eat? Are you comfortable? Do you want something to read? And to which, you know, he kind of worked up to him. And, oh, oh no, I'm, I'm doing really good there, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Captain. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for asking. And right before he leaves, he goes, oh, hey, uh, uh, by the way, geez, I've been meaning to tell you, we found your ex-wife. She's been buried in a potato patch behind the house. And he walked off. <laughs> An hour later, Callahan come back and he says, well, Thomas, I'm going to leave for the evening. I hope everything's fine. And at this point, Thomas is getting really frustrated. And he's like, well, you know, I think maybe we need to talk. In which Callahan says, puts on his hat and says, oh, surely it can wait till morning. And made him sweat on this all night long. Well, needless to say, by the next morning, he had a lot to say. Uh, but he swore up and down. It was self-defense. They had a shootout in the house. But he pawned the guns, and nobody ever found the guns, and that, unfortunately, whiskey had led to his downfall. Uh, but he swore up and down. The, the story changed several times in how it occurred, but somehow, from the bed level, she shot at him first, he shot back, and it was all self-defense. Anyhow, we're going to come back to that. Asked about the blood, uh, Thomas claimed that after the shooting, he doesn't know what happened. He was so drunk that he just laid in bed next to her and passed out. And then when he woke up the next day and saw her there, he ran out of the house, and he heard nothing for three or four days. And he figured, oh, wow, nobody discovered her missing. So he went back to the house, and that's when he decided to bury her in the back in her potato patch. Needless to say, there's our gent right there. He's a keeper. Um, anyways, goes to court, and um, on uh, December 8th, 1908, unable to obviously prove uh, uh, self-defense. They also could not prove uh, premeditation. And so the verdict uh, was brought down to murder two, in which he was convicted and he ends up going to uh, Walla Walla. Now this is an interesting photo. I uh, should have had it up earlier. So what do you do on Sunday? This is Monday's paper. So what do you do Sunday after you go to church but you got your finest on? why we go out to the murder site and have the <laughs> photographer for the American uh, examiner here, the, the, uh, uh, the Reveille basically, take a photo of you around the grave while other people, according to paper, are having a wonderful day finding souvenirs in the house. <laughs> so that's what you do back then, I guess. Oh, and I guess I got kind of behind, but anyways, uh, sorry about that. But anyways, we do have uh, uh, the prosecutor and the judge and the, uh, um, 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 and the defense attorney here. And I noticed that maybe getting off from the alcohol, he seems to be changing quite a lot. And I'll show you another photo in, the, uh, in a moment here. Now, aftermath. An extraordinary piece of evidence is discovered in Thomas's prison file when I go down and dig through stuff. And this was never in the press. An official statement dated June of 1913 that stated that H.D. Ramsey was hired to take down the house by John Dyer, James's brother-in-law and his sister's uh, uh, Della's husband, uh, because the house was being used as a flop house and they were afraid that it was going to uh, catch on fire and burn down. 
So they were hoping to save some of the, uh, of the wood from the, uh, from the house. Uh, they didn't just wreck it, they were tearing it down methodically. When uh, Ramsey, while pulling out the bedroom door casing, which was in fairly good dis uh, shape, until he noticed right above his head, there was some splinters. Well, when he pulled it down on investigation, he found a 32 caliber bullet in it, which affirms that there was some sort of a shootout. Uh, pulling the wood apart and taking it down, he showed it to Dyer, and Dyer said, whoa, don't show that to the sisters. Oh my gosh, he says, They'll be, they've been hammering on getting Thomas out all this time. You're just gonna be causing trouble, don't say anything. And he takes the bullet and the casing away. Now, I don't know what happens, but eventually, um, uh, uh, a statement, they did a statement, um, with Dyer and Ramsey. Somebody must have had a guilty conscience and went to the prosecutor, I don't know. However, by July of 1914, a paper was slipped in the warden's file, the prisoner file, and the governor's file, and it was never made public. Um, and years later, um, uh, Governor Warren ha had looked it over and placed a copy in his file. And so what would have, could have happened is he would have been released or it could have been reduced to manslaughter. But in either case, James was pardoned in August 3rd, 1917 on good behavior and he moved in with Della and her husband at the monogram where he died in December of 1930. And you can see he, well, he looks a little bit more cleaned up there than the previous anyways. So I'm gonna give you uh, one more story. I don't know where we are on time, so I, I apologize. Do you guys wanna hear one more? It's a shorter story. Okay, this is my, one of my particular favorites. And first of all, when I say that newspaper, people go, oh, the news is just so bloody and, and salacious and all that stuff. How would you like to wake up in the morning, have your coffee, and see this? <laughs> At least we don't see a body on the front page of our paper anymore, if we even see a paper. The murder of Hermit Smith, and which I call the mysterious uh, Hermit Smith, and this is in the summer of 1909. So the story starts at, as this. Newspapers start hearing about uh, uh, folks in um, uh, Prairie in Skagit County, you know, I, was, I, I did a program in, in Cedar Woolley. I had about 37 people, and cans went up immediately and said, where's Prairie? I'm like, this is, <laughs> I thought you guys were gonna tell me more about it. Anyways, if it was ever a community, it was north of, um, of Cedar Woolley, up by the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the county line, and just on the other side is uh, uh, Saxon, Wickersham, and, and Acme. Anyways, farmers and folks alike were very flustered that spring and early summer as they feared that an unknown wild man was living in the woods. An unknown stranger has come among us and that they had fears that he was going to end up stealing their cattle, raiding their gardens, their gardens, and maybe break into their houses, and worse yet, said the paper, accosting their women folk. Something needed to be done about this wild man. Well, after getting reports, the, the, the uh, Skagit Sheriff's Office and the Whatcom uh, 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 Sheriff's Office, it was decided to both of them send deputies out and tromps around to locate this, this hideous wild man and find out exactly who this person was. After hours of tromping around, they finally came across a gentleman calling himself Smith. And, claim, and, and he was living in a dilapidated hunter's cabin, uh, dirt floor, it was a shell, and certainly not winterized by any means. And so um, they started questioning him. Well, needless to say, they discovered that they were actually on the Skagit line, but the walk-in deputy stuck around anyways to see what was going on. And they talked to Smith, who had, was very evasive in all their questioning. Um, he wouldn't give his real name, and so they kind of claimed that uh, he was just a hermit, 
take money, nothing to do with people or civilization, and that he just didn't want anything to do with anyone. The deputies decided that Smith was possibly an ex-con. He might be wanted for a crime, but they don't have a warrant for him or anything, and they didn't feel like hauling him all the way in. And they figured that he was just an odd character. Um, regardless, uh, um, he did not appear to be dangerous. As a matter of fact, they wrote in their report that although Smith smelled kind of bad due to his poor hygiene living in the woods, but he appeared well-groomed, he was very intelligent, um, took care of his attire, uh, considering his circumstances. Um, he cut his own hair. They noticed he would trim his nails. His nails were cut. He even trimmed his whiskers. And um, they were kind of mystified. But they just left him alone, came back into their respected communities and said they checked into it and believe me, he doesn't want anything more to do with you than you him. And for the rest of the summer, nothing more happened. Until September 10th, 1909, a Swiss-born uh, gentleman by the name of Frank Erfer and two women were fishing and camping on the South Fork for a few days. To me, that's just kind of odd right there. A guy and two women camping in the woods. It just doesn't seem like something that was appropriate at that time. But nevertheless, Frank decided that they were getting ready to head back. Frank decided that, uh, hey, you know, girls, you know what would be fun? There's a hermit living out here. Let's go find him. So they go on out, and they're looking around, and they see the cabin. And so Frank starts yelling out, because he doesn't know if he's going to get shot. And he's like, Mr. Hermit Smith, we're coming just to visit. Don't shoot. We're safe. And so what do they see? But they see this. They go running uh, into uh, Sax Saxon and then eventually into Bellingham and uh, told the uh, sheriff's department. And the sheriff's department obviously said, well, that's Skagit County. It has nothing to do with us. So they notified them and the guys down there, well, the deputy knew where to go, so him and another deputy and the coroner packed up and headed up into the woods where they find uh, uh, Hermit Smith laid out just as you see him. And uh, Coroner uh, Kess uh, Kessel went with them. It was a hot day, and this is how they found him with a bullet in his head. All right. Officers, uh, the officers conclude right off, ah, oh, you know, it's September, it's a hunting accident, the poor unfortunate guy got hit in the head, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a darn shame, but these things happen. Castle, who was very thorough, and he's like, well, we're not lugging him back. This guy reeks, he's bloated, and there's insects all over him, we're going to bury him here, but until we do that, I may as well do uh, a formal, you know, uh, look over the body. And so he kind of shifts the body around and figures from the hole in the head that he had to have been sitting uh, probably on that log right behind him, and he had to have been knelt, bent over because the bullet was sort of in the top of the head in the front. So he's like, well, that's just kind of odd. And so he kind of like angles him around, and then he tells the deputies, he goes, all right, I think uh, the, whatever happened came from that direction. You boys go check it out. Well, here's where the story turns. Because they get out there, they want to go home, man. They're just sweating and they just like, you know, we found him and he stinks, let's bury him. And they're walking around and all of a sudden they see some limbs that are snapped. And they follow along. And not too far away, they find a blind. They find laid out where somebody had laid probably all night. They notice once they got there, that they had a perfect view for all the limbs that were snapped. So the accident theory kind of uh, went out. In investigating the cabin, they noticed that it's full of canned goods, but nothing else except for a crossbow. Well, obviously, Hermit Smith is not set for winter. He doesn't know anything about what he's doing, and nobody sits out there and clips their nails and takes care of himself, so it brings up, who the heck is this? Smith guy. Who is he? Um, they ended up burying the body and coming back. Uh, fortunately, one of the deputies brought a camera and obviously took some pictures. And so, um, let's see, what's our next image? 
They come back and they, what they typically do is they, they put together a, um, a, um, um, a circular and they send it out to all the, the, the police departments and sheriff's departments and say, do you know who this guy is? We're trying to figure it out. Well, it wasn't too terribly long that a couple of logging companies and, and uh, uh, timber mill sawmills get on there, you know, and they go out and investigate. And all they know is, yeah, we know that guy. He went by the name of Tallman or Tillman. I believe it was Tallman. And we know nothing about him. He would just get his check. The guys would ask him stuff. He wouldn't talk. We knew nothing about him. We don't know where he was from or nothing. And if anybody said too much, he would leave and he would go to another camp. And he kept going from camp to camp. Uh, seems like any time anybody wanted to know more about him, this is what would happen. Uh, officers went to Acme and Saxon and asked if they knew him. If you read uh, the Saxon story in the back, there's some stories in there about people seeing this man hiding behind trees and diverting off the road and stuff. And from that, we discovered that he paid cash for every, uh, all of his purchases and did not talk. And people in the stores are like, well, we're not going to talk to him and, and ruin this customer who's paying cash. And so the circulars go out, and this is all they know. Until, oh, yeah, Hermit's Life and uh, Death Veiled in Mystery. And Cade, again, at his desk, and remember him from the previous story, one day is going through some of his old mail and stuff that's been piling up, and he sees this circular, and he opens it up, and he kind of looks at it, and does a double take, and he goes, dang, I, I know I know this guy. So he sends out to Seattle for a former circular that he had thrown out a long time ago. The circular comes, and he compares them, and he says, I know who this is. This is my favorite part, because strangely enough, I knew the name. And then whenever I say it, boom, people just sit there and they just stare at me like I'm nuts. But anyways, he believes it's this, the, the uh, Cade says he solved this. And it's none other, the dead man is Jack Simpkins. Nobody's jumping up. Nobody knows Jack Simpkins. All right, okay. But in the day, the turn of the century, Simpkins, who's kind of went out of vogue, his name, and nobody remembers him anymore, would have been that time period's Jimmy Hoffa or Amelia Earhart. He just disappeared. And what it was is, if maybe now you might remember, back in that time when unions and management were funny, one of the key things that, um, um, that was used by assassins and union uh, people was dynamite. Everybody was blowing everything up. So if you remember that, houses, management houses were getting blown up and all the time. Well, the, the big story that people would have been sitting on their chairs and just as much as what happened to Jimmy Hoffa would have been what happened to Simpkins because... Uh, in 1905, December 30th, Frank Stuenberg, who was the former governor of, of Idaho, was coming home, and he went to open his gate, and boom, he blew up. And it's always been thought that um, uh, the Western Federation of Miners um, uh, had it out for him for, uh, uh, I don't know exactly what he did, sent in troops and uh, union busters and stuff like that. And so a guy who's a well-known name at the time, Harry uh, Orchard, was arrested, and uh, several others put on trial for murder, and they end up going to prison. Simpkins was the middleman. He was the man that was sent there to make sure these guys did their job. And after this happened, he disappeared, literally off the face of the earth. And there has been all kinds of conspiracy stories and everything you can imagine. Um, even, there's even, if you get online and look, there's even a lot of uh, suspicion that the Pinkertons themselves sent him, infiltrated the unions, and, and even was in on this plot just so that he could turn in people. But we'll never know. He disappeared. The theories are off the wall. I mean, even 1906, they're saying, well, we think that he's drinking whatever they drink down in South America, kicking back with a ton of money. 
Somebody paid him off. Somebody might have offed him because he knew too much. But we never found him. But Cade was determined and said that to his death, he swears it's him. He even, uh, this is the, uh, um, um, uh, what he got from the Pinkertons for, uh, for Simpkins. Then he compared the photos and put this in the paper, the crossbow that was taken. Then he put together a composite. He sent it to the Pinkertons. He sent it, almost done. He sent it to the Pinkertons. He sent it to Seattle. He sent it to the courts in Idaho. Never received an answer. Well, one thing is positive. I think we're... All right, that's the last slide. So, is it wishful thinking? Do we really want to think, oh, we solved the mystery of the beginning of the last, beginning of the last century. We found Simpkins. Maybe, maybe not. Cade thinks so. He thinks he nailed it. At the same time, wishful thinking, maybe. But let's ask these questions just for the fun of it. Simpkins disappeared off the face of the earth. It was in nobody's best interest for him to reappear, for anybody, especially if he was double-crossing people. And uh, the other question I would have to say is, why did nobody respond to Cade's questioning? And the other question beyond that is, why would somebody set up a blind in the middle of the night, sit there all night on their belly, behind, waiting for a hermit to come out of his shack so he could shoot him in the head. Thank you for coming. <laughs>